Good morning, everyone. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. You have died and your life is hidden in Christ in God. Keep seeking the things above. Keep seeking the things above Keep seeking the things above Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God When He appears who oh, is our life Shall appear with him In the splendor of his glory So put off the old man Put on the new The one created In Christ Jesus Keep seeking The things above Keep seeking The things above Keep seeking the things above Where Christ is seated at the right hand Seated at the right hand Is a man on the throne Don't you ever forget Oh, our hope is coming soon And this world could never satisfy Our hungry so is seated at the right hand seated at the right hand of God oh there is a man yeah at his right hand oh there is a man yeah at his right hand Hey, good morning again, and if you could turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, I'll hang up guitar and be right back. All right. Well, good morning again. And uh, again, if you haven't turned there already, go. please do now. Go to uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. And uh, we're continuing our study of the book of Ephesians, of course. Uh, today will be our 137th hour in Ephesians. And I'm just going to see if I can just check this here. Okay, I think I'm going to use that. I get this new lighting camera thing for my uh, lighting here, so I, I like it. So I'm just changing it around. It's a dark day outside, so we got a lot of thunderstorms going through. All right, uh, so yeah, we're going to continue our study. Today will be the 137th hour in Ephesians, and we're continuing our study of, of the book of Ephesians. We are just started Ephesians chapter 3 uh, last week, I believe. And uh, so uh, today, 
uh, we're moving on to verse 3, and we'll be, this, uh, we'll be on Ephesians 3, 3 this whole week. And again, the reason why I might sit on a verse for a week is because of the content. And so there's a lot in this, these, these verses in Ephesians, so I'm taking my time going through and explaining everything and putting them all together so you see the big picture, not just the, fo- the trees in the forest. And so today we'll be looking at the A part of Ephesians 3, 3, where Paul identifies his stewardship as a mystery. Now we saw he's introduced us to this uh, subject of his stewardship, which actually mentions in, in Colossians chapter 1, uh, as we saw in our previous class. And so today he's going to describe it uh, continue to identify his stewardship as a mystery, and then he goes on to explain that even further. And uh, it's related, of course, as we see the content of this mystery, as we'll see, and have been talking about and alluding to uh, in the last several weeks, and in the, in the past, too, when we were in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, is that uh, G- Gentile uh, church-age believers are now co-heirs, co-members of the body of Christ, and co-partakers of the Messianic promise because of their faith in Jesus Christ, their justification and their union identification uh, with him through the baptism of the Spirit at justification. So Jewish and Gentile believers are co-heirs, co-members of the body of Christ, and co-partakers uh, of, the, of the Messianic promise because of their faith in Christ at justification and union identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. So uh, g- great stuff uh, that we're uh, talking about here. And it's all related to, as well, the millennial reign. We'll tie it into the millennial reign, which is mentioned in Ephesians 1.10. It's, deci- uh, uh, it's also related, of course, to the church being the new humanity that's going to rule over the works of God's hands, restoring humanity back to its rightful place as the ruler of planet Earth, where t- Satan now is temporarily the god of this world. And, of course, at the second advent of Christ, uh, the church led by Jesus Christ is going to dispossess Satan and his, and his, and his uh, fellow evil spirits. And then we'll have our millennial reign, the thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, literal, bodily reign. So, uh, this, so this is very important for us as believers to know this and because we need to know this because we also want to uh, live in a manner in our lives, live our lives in a manner consistent with the fact that what God's going to do for us in the future. We've talked about how He, he wants us to, to think, he, he wants us to live a certain way, a godly way, according to His, his uh, holy standards, based upon what He's done for us in the past, at election and ju- uh, predestination and eternity past, and what He did for us at the cross with His Son, Jesus Christ, and redeeming us out of the slave market of sin, and then what He also did with us at the moment of justification through the Holy Spirit and the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And now he's going to start talking about, uh, and he talks about Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians 1.10, he talks about the millennial reign. And uh, so we, it's, it's, uh, everything's tied together. We'll, we'll, we'll start seeing um, this mystery is actually being developed for, in chapter 3. Uh, we've already in, introduced to the mystery of the Father's will, which is related to the church age believer in his election of predestination and eternity past in chapter 1. Then Ephesians 2.11-22 through 22 actually develops that even further, saying that Jewish and Gentile church age believers are composed the new humanity and uh and then chapter three now we're going to see he's going to develop this even further by asserting that again that gentile church age believers are co-heirs co-members of the body of christ and fellow park takers of the messianic promise with jewish believers in the church because again of their justification by faith and, and union identification with jesus through the baptism of the spirit so let's uh let's take a moment of silent prayer this is a custom we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves and determine if we're in fellowship with god because any mental verbal or overt act of sin that we knowingly commit will cause us to lose fellowship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to the Father, He, God the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, He purifies us from each and every wrongdoing. We maintain that fellowship by obeying the Spirit who speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. And that's when we're obeying the commands of Ephesians 5, 18 to be filled with the Spirit, and Colossians 3, 16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our souls. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing and distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another day. We thank you for the grace, the faith, the salvation, and working on behalf of eternity past and the personal work of your Son of the Cross, the work of the Holy Spirit, and our lives from regeneration to resurrection. We thank you for all the blessings that we have as members of the, 
the body of Christ, our spiritual, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places because of our faith in your Son at justification and our union identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. Thank you, Father, for making us a members of the new humanity that along with Jewish church age believers and your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, is going to rule over the works of your hands, restoring humanity to its rightful place as rulers of this earth and dispossessing Satan and the kingdom of darkness at uh, the second advent of your Son. We just thank you, Father, for these things. We thank you so much for the blessings that we don't earn or deserve, and we got them, We know based upon the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ, as well as based upon the merits of our union identification with Him. And we just thank you, Father, for uh, those who have been supporting this ministry with their prayers and financial support and uh, service over the years. And I thank you for the faithfulness to you, for this ministry and myself, Father. I thank you for the people who might be joining me live and uh, or a later date through the recordings on our website. I pray, Father, that each person in the audience that is a child of God, uh, through faith in your Son, would uh, help help them to learn, understand, and apply what's being taught through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Please break down any barriers that sin and Satan might put up to hinder that from happening. And also empower me to deliver the f full counsel to your people with regards to this uh, subject of uh, we're talking about here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3, with Paul's stewardship and the mystery of Christ. And I just pray, Father, that you'd help me to to bring forth the message with accuracy and clarity, reverence, respect, and power so your people could receive the necessary spiritual nourishment because your word taught, has taught us that man does not live on bread alone, but from every word that proceeds out of your mouth. So I just pray there'll be no problems also with the recordings, the video, and the audio, and uploading these things to our various website, podcasts, and media platforms that you've given to us. I pray you use them mightily and continue to do so and protect them from the enemy and continue to do that. And I pray there be no problems with streaming video by YouTube. Thank you for the people taking advantage of the live uh, uh, streaming service by provided by YouTube. And I just pray it would function properly and, and uh, protect it too from the enemy. So Father, we pray that as a result of this class, we'll, all of us would uh, continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of your great, uh, great God and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. All right, it should be at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. As I said before, we're going to be, this is the first hour a uh, first of three hours uh, in Ephesians 3 3 this whole week will be you looking be in that verse because of the content of the verse there's a lot to talk about and uh, we'll see that uh, today we're going to be noting the fact that Paul identifies his stewardship as a mystery and then uh, we also see that uh, he's going to talk to about a, two, on Thursday we're going to see that he received this as a this mystery as revelation from the Holy Spirit and then uh, he's going to also on Saturday we'll see that he mentions this already in brief uh, briefly in the letter. And as we'll see, that's in verses 3 through 14 of uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and also Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So uh, this, what he's talking about in Ephesians chapter 3 is something that he's actually uh, talked about in, in brief and previous in the letter. Now, remember where we're at in the letter. So we are in chapter 3, uh, we have uh, in verse 1, uh, Paul says, for this reason, he bows his knees to the Father. And uh, the reason, so he's going to, it looks like he's going to go and communicate uh, an intercessory prayer that he offered up to the Father regularly and communicated to the recipients of this letter who were Gentile Christians in the Roman province of Asia. And uh, yet, but he doesn't do that immediately. Uh, he breaks it off and he has what we, he uses the figure of Anacluthon where he breaks it off. Uh, and doesn't uh, res resume the, and present to us the content of the prayer until verses uh, uh, verses 14 through the end of the chapter. And so we have in verse 2, uh, he goes into, uh, he has a first class condition, uh, which basically is uh, presenting the assumption of truth for the, assumption of, for the sake of argument. In other words, it's a tool of persuasion that Greek-speaking people used because they were debaters. And uh, so... He, he has that, that uh, first class condition, which is the assumption of truth for the sake of argument, has two parts. The if part, they call it in, uh, in, in Greek grammar, uh, the protasis. The uh, then clause is the apotasis, which is the inference from the premise, the protasis. And so what's, I mean, when, he, when he presents the, the protasis in verse 2, he doesn't uh, complete it until verse 13. Uh, with the apotheosis. And so, in, in other words, he didn't want them to be upset by his Roman imprisonment. And, but he develops, before, in the, in the protasis, he develops this whole idea of his stewardship uh, that he received from God at the moment of his justific uh, justification. And uh, so, and he had this uh, stewardship, which is basically his apostleship, and it involved the activity of an apostle, 
which was to communicate this mystery doctrine for the church age with regard to the relationship between Jewish and Gentile church age believers. So, uh, so we, what we have here is that Paul's continuing in verses three, uh, three through 13, uh, 12, he's developing the protasis in greater detail. And then he finishes the first class conditional statement in verse 13 by presenting the apotesis. Basically, in other words, he's trying to persuade them, don't be upset. There's a reason why I'm in prison right now. And it's because I'm being persecuted and I'm unjustly treated because of what I'm teaching is a threat to Satan and his kingdom. And so uh, that, then he goes on to the, the inter second intercessory prayer in verses 14 through the end of the chapter, which uh, that intercessory prayer, like the first, serves as a hinge in the letter. And with regards to the second intercessory prayer, as we'll see, it's a hinge to the final chapters of the book, which is actually the application section of the book. Because the first three chapters have, we call the indicatives of the Christian faith. Uh, but then in chapters four, five, and six, we have a lot of prohibitions and commands, which is basically teaching us the application of the first three chapters of the book. And really is the purpose of this whole thing. This letter is basically that Paul wants to maintain unity experientially in the Christian community, in particular, between the Jewish and Gentile wings of the church. And so he talks about this in brief in Romans. He talks about that in Romans 14 and also uh, in other places. So he, he's, uh, he's, he's concerned about that. So he, we know we have unity experience, uh, in a positional sense through the baptism of the Spirit of justification uh, uh, between Jewish and Gentile church age believers. And then in the perfective sense, we'll know we'll have it at the, at the resurrection of the church where we get our resurrection bodies. But in the meantime, he wants that to happen, that, that unity to be experiential, uh, but through the practice of the command to love one another, which is the bond of unity, as we saw in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. So this is where we're at in the letter. So uh, he's going to continue to develop this protasis uh, and uh, which is indicates the assumption of truth for the sake of argument, and he's trying to persuade them not to be discouraged by his Roman imprisonment, because that's where he was. It was his first Roman imprisonment. In fact, when he was in Rome between 60 and 62 AD, uh, he wrote not only Ephesians, but Colossians and Philemon, two books that we've done, and also Philippians, another book I haven't really finished. I started in, 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 in Iowa, but never finished it, but uh, we'll do that someday. And uh, so he's he's in Roman his own Roman imprisonment. So he's trying to get he doesn't want them to be discouraged by it because actually it's serving a purpose, and there's a reason for it. All right, so let's look at chapter three, and I'll read from the uh, the Net Bible chapter three, and then we'll go back and look at verse uh, three in detail. So it says in Ephesians three one again. I'm reading from the Net Bible. It says, "For this reason, I Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles." If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, that by revelation the divine secret was made known to me, as I wrote before briefly. When reading this, you'll be able to understand my insight into this mystery of Christ. Now this secret was not disclosed to people and former generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Namely, that through the gospel the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the exercise of his power. To me, less than least of all the saints, this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, a secret that has been hidden for ages in God who has created all things. The purpose of this enlightenment is that through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rulers and authorities and the heavenly realms. That's speaking of Satan and his kingdom. We saw that expression in the, in the first chapter. This was according to the eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access to God because of Christ's faithfulness. For this reason, I ask you not to, there's the apotheosis in verse 13, for this reason I ask you not to lose heart because of what I'm suffering for you which is for your glory. Now he goes into his intercessory prayer. See this phrase, for this reason? We saw that in verse 1. Two to, uh, we see the, um, what's the expression? I should know by now. Tuto harin. And uh, that uh, particular expression is repeated, that we have it in verse 1, which presents, is saying that what he's going to say now in verse 1 is, the, is based upon what he taught them in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So for this reason is saying again, because it's repeated that the basis for his prayer is found in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, which means that he's interceding in prayer for these Gentile church age believers based upon the fact that they, they along with Jewish church age believers, 
are forming the new humanity that's going to reign over the works of God's hands during Christ's millennial reign. So he says in verse 14, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, so that, because you have been rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and thus to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up to the, all the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power that is working within us is able to do far beyond all that we ask or think, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Now, uh, let me show you my translation of verses 1 through 13. And uh, so it says in verse 1, For this reason I myself, Paul, the prisoner owned by and under the authority of the one and only Christ, who is Jesus, for the benefit of each and every one of you as a corporate unit who are Gentiles, if and let us assume it's true for the sake of argument that each and every one of you as a corporate unit have surely heard about the stewardship which is unique to the grace which originates from the one and only God which was given to me for the benefit of all of you as a corporate unit without exception. Of course, every one of you in fact have heard about it. Response to first class condition there. Namely, verse 3, that the mystery was made known for the benefit of myself as revelation as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner concerning which mystery, that is, by each of you making it your habit of hearing read publicly, all of you will, for your own benefit, become able to comprehend my insight into this incomparable mystery, which is produced by your unique union and identification with Christ. This mystery was by no, may, by no means made known to members of the human race in previous generations, as it has now been revealed through the personal agency of his holy apostles, as well as prophets, by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit. Namely, that the Gentiles, our fellow heirs, as, fellow, as well as fellow members of the body, likewise fellow partakers of the promise because of justification by faith in and union and identification with Christ Jesus by means of the proclamation of the gospel. I assume this position and responsibility of serving this gospel according to the gift originating from the one and only God's grace, which was given to me according to the activity produced by the exercise of his power to me the less than least of all the saints, this grace was given in order to proclaim for my benefit to the Gentiles the unfathomable wealth brought about by this justification by faith in and union and identification with Christ. Specifically, in order to cause everyone to be enlightened as to what constitutes this unique dispensation, which is a mystery, which has been hidden from previous ages because of God's will, who has caused each and every animate and inanimate object to be created. Consequently, the multifaceted wisdom produced by the manifestation of the will of God was made known to the sovereign rulers and governmental authorities through the members and uh, governmental authorities in the heavenlies through the members of the church. Then he says in verse 11, this was in conformity. He says this was in conformity with the eternal predetermined plan, which he caused to be accomplished by means of our faith in and union and identification with the one and only Christ, who is Jesus, who is the one and only Lord ruling over each and every one of us as a corporate unit. On the basis of our faith in and union and identification with him, each and every one of us are experiencing boldness, namely access with confidence to the presence of the Father by means of his faithfulness. Therefore, I myself urgently request at the present time that each and every one of you as a corporate unit not be discouraged because of my adversities on behalf of all of you without exception, which are unique in character making possible for each and every one of you to receive honor. That's speaking rewards, uh, the very last expression there in verse 13. That's speaking of uh, rewards for faithful service at the Bema seat. So Ephesians 3.3, 3, our verse today and all this week, is composed of the following uh, in the Greek text. We have the Hodi Epexegetical Clause, which is Hodi Kata Apokolupsen Egonoriste Moi to Mosterion which is translated by myself, namely that the mystery was made known for the benefit of myself as revelation. The net Bible, they translated that by revelation, the divine secret was made known to me. Then we have, following it, we have a comparative clause, which is pro eg rafa en holigo, holigo, excuse me, 
Holigo goes. <laughs> That's how you pronounce it. I get the, the, the uh, accent in the wrong thing. Holigo, which is translated by myself as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner. So the Net Bible translates it as I wrote before briefly. So uh, we have it's a, this verse is composed of a Hodi Ep exegetical clause as well as it followed by a comparative clause. Now the Hodi Ep exegetical clause c- explains actually. Ep exegetical simply means it's explaining something. Here, it's actually explaining the, the noun that we saw in verse 2, aquinomia, which is the word stewardship. And it specifically, uh, this clause explains the nature of this stewardship. Namely, it is being a steward of the mystery or the divine secret that was made known to Paul by revelation from the Holy Spirit. Now, as was the case in Ephesians 1.9, if you recall, the, the noun musterion, here in verse 3, means the same thing as it did in verse chapter 1, verse 9. It means mystery or divine secret, like the Net Bible translates it. And the reason why is that this word pertains to the content of that which was been, has been not been known before, which has been revealed to an in-group, we could say, or restricted constituency. Let me repeat that. This word mystery, and Ephesians 1, 9 and Ephesians 3, 3, it means mystery, divine secret, because the word pertains to the content of that which has not been known before, but which has been revealed to in in-group, we could say, or restricted consist- constituency. Now, it pertains to a secret whose party, a concerned party, is a deity alone, and those to whom he chooses to share the information, especially concerning the method and history of God's redemption or other supernatural information. Now, in verses one nine, Ephesians 1 9 and Ephesians 3 3. This word musterion, mystery, in context, it speaks of a truth which was not known to Old Testament saints, but has now been revealed by the Father through the Spirit during the church age to the apostles who communicated it to the church. Now, in Ephesians 1 9, we saw this word refers to the divine secret or the mystery of the Father's will for the church age believer. And that verse, we saw that that word speaks mysterion, mystery, speaks of a truth which was also not known to Old Testament saints, but has now been revealed by the Father through the Spirit during the church age, again, to the apostles who communicated to the church. And in verse 9 of chapter 1, this word mysterion, mystery, is identified by its genitive adjunct, which is the phrase to the lamatos, out to, which is translated of his will. So that would mean this mystery of the Father's will is identified in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 as the Father electing church-age believers by predestinating them for the purpose of adoption as sons for His purpose because of His love through Jesus Christ. Thus it was according to His will, we saw in Ephesians 1, 9, to elect church-age believers by predestinating them for the purpose of adoption as His sons for His purpose alone because of His love through Jesus Christ. So this mystery is now developed, that we talked about initially in Ephesians 1, okay, verses 3 through 14, and in particular verse 9. This mystery is being developed further here in Ephesians 3, and in particular verses 5 and 6, because these verses assert that Gentile believers are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the Messianic promise because of their faith in Christ Jesus at justification and their union identification with them through the baptism of the Spirit, and so they're uh, fellow heirs, fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the Messianic promise with Jewish believers. Both groups compose, as we saw, uh, those who have been elected by the Father, which was accomplished by predestinating them for the purpose of adoption as sons for himself alone because of his love through their faith in and union and identification with his son. Therefore, the development of this mystery in Ephesians 3, 5 through 6, is that these verses are identifying for the reader that not only Jewish Christians are elected and predestinated and in union with Christ and identified with Him, but also Gentile Christians. So this development was necessary because the promise, because the promise of the Holy Spirit was originally given to the apostles and disciples of Jesus who were all Jewish because this promise was given to the Jewish people under the New Covenant. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, and Ezekiel 36, 27. And the recipients of this epistle were Gentile Christians, okay? So we got a development going on here. So we're going back to eternity past in chapter one, right? And he talks about the mystery of the Father's will, which in context speaks of the Father in eternity past electing church age believers, both Jew and Gentile believers uh, in the church age, electing them to privilege of 
elected him to the privilege of a relationship and a fellowship with him, an eternal relationship and fellowship with him. And, uh, and he did this by predestinating us to adoption as his sons. And uh, that's Roman style adoption, as we pointed out. So uh, now, so now we get to chapter uh, two, verses 11 through 22. We're gonna see how the tie-in goes there too. But bef before I talk about that, chapter three, again, he, re he repeats the word mystery. And this time he's using it in relation to Jewish and Gentile believers being, again, co-heirs, uh, co-members of the body of Christ and co-partakers of the Messianic promise because of, because of their faith in Christ, the justification and union identification with him. So that's a development on the mystery that was initially introduced to us in chapter 1. Now you put tie in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. That passage we pointed out says the Jewish and Gentile church age, believe, church age believers are actually members of the new humanity, okay? That is going to rule over the works of God's hands and dispossess Satan and the fallen angels at the second advent of Christ. Very interesting what Paul's doing here. So, therefore, in Ephesians 3.3, 3, the referent, uh, what the word mystery is referring to is that Gentile and Ch Jewish church age believers are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the promise because of their faith in Jesus at justification and their union identification with him which was the result of their obedience to the gospel. Now, Ephesians 3.3 3 is therefore expanding or explaining in greater detail or provides more information about the Father's will for the church age believer in Ephesians 1.9, namely it, that it also involves Gentile and Jewish church age believers being, fell, again, fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ and fellow partakers of the messianic promise. And uh, therefore, in each instance, the word here, musterion, has the same reference because the Father's will for the church age believer, which was not known in the Old Testament prophets, is that Gentile and Jewish church age believers, again, are fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, fellow partakers of the promise because of their faith in Christ, the justification and union identification with him through the baptism of the Spirit. We're heirs with that Jewish believers because we're going to inherit the earth. <laughs> We're going to inherit the earth and we're going to have rewards for faithful service, resurrection body, but we're going to reign with Christ in the millennial reign. We inherit the earth. Isn't the, all the earth Christ? Yes. And are we not the bride of Christ, members of his body? He's the head. Are we not going to inherit the world? Yes. You don't know it yet. Maybe now is the time. Not only are you rich spiritually, because your relationship, eternal relationship and fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is worth much more than any money or or materials that God could ever give you, temporal blessings. But we're going to inherit the earth, boys and girls. <laughs> I don't think believers really get that. I just don't think, they, it's just like, oh, it's so far down the road. It's not that far away. It's not. might be closer than you think. In fact, I know it's closer than you think, and I think. So that's, that's incredible. So that means your aristocracy, your rulers, male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, we're members of the new humanity. And right now, the world's a mess. Well, our country is a mess. And our, the world's a mess. And it ain't getting any better. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. And when the rapture takes place, which is imminent, uh, you really think everything's going to go to pot then. And you have the manifestation of the Antichrist. And he starts, the, he establishes the treaty with Israel, which begins the 70th week of Daniel, and which is the worst time in all of human history and Israel's history, where Satan is cast out of heaven in the midway point of the tribulation period with his angels. And he's upset because he knows he's got very little time left, so he's going to take out his wrath on the Jewish people, trying to exterminate them. And then you have God's casting, and Jesus Christ, the Father, the Lamb of God, casting out, ex exercising his wrath uh, during the last three and a half years of the 70th week with his seven seal trumpet and bold judgments recorded for us in Revelation 6-18. to and that designed to, uh, to also bring people to crisis evangelism, show them their need for him as a savior. And many Gentiles will get saved and many Jews are going to get saved. In fact, we're going to have the national regeneration of the nation of Israel at the second advent of Christ, which will be fulfilled the day of atonement. Uh, talked about in Reve uh, Zechariah 12 and 14 and Revelation 19 and 20. So you have and, and the Olivet Discourse of our Lord in Matthew 24. So uh, we're a part of that. We're part of all this thing. We're, we, we, you are somebody because God made us someone and we didn't earn and deserve it. We didn't earn and deserve all these things. This is amazing. This is fascinating. And, you know, the Old Testament talked about the, 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 the Gentiles getting saved. 
but it never ever knew anything about this where we were going to be on equal footing with Jewish believers, us Gentiles. And not only that, but you got women who were, who had never had this kind of prop, uh, opportunities in the Old Testament Israel. Only men could be, only the, the patriarch before the law, the patriarch like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were the, the Noah, they were the patriarchs of the family, they were the royal priests for the family. Then you get the Levitical priests in the, under the law. Only they, those guys could be, from the tribe of Levi, could be uh, Levitical priests and, and, and uh, take part in the, the tabernacle and temple worship. But then when you get to the church age, you have a universal royal priesthood where it's male, female, Jew, and Gentile, slave, and free. I oh, mean, it's just, it, this is, we don't, because it, for 2,000 years the church has been primarily Gentile, we, we take these things for granted. In the first century, it was not taken for granted. This was astounding. And it was astounding to the Jewish believers, you know, like the, the apostles. So in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, as we just read, uh, teaches that it was the mystery that the Gentiles, through faith in Christ, would become fellow heirs with Jewish believers, fellow members of the body of Christ, and fellow partakers of the four unconditional promise covenants of promise to Israel. This mystery is not that the Gentiles would be saved, because as I said before, a few moments ago, this was prophesied in the Old Testament. Isaiah 11.10, at that time, a root from Jesse will stand like a signal flag for the nations, and the nations will look to him for guidance, and his residence will be maj majestic. Isaiah 60, verse 3, nations come to your light, kings to bring to, to your bright light, speaking of Christ, the light of the world. So the mystery is not the Gentiles would be saved, since this was again prophesied in the Old Testament. Rather, the mystery concerning the Gentiles is that they would become fellow heirs with Jewish believers, fellow members of the, with Jewish uh, believers in the body of Christ, fellow partakers of the covenants of promise to Israel. So the content of this mystery is threefold. One, uh, Gentile believers are fellow heirs with Jewish believers in the sense that they share the same spiritual riches God gave them because of his covenant with Abraham. And then we also see, uh, number two, Gentile believers in Christ are fellow, again, fellow members of the body of Christ with Jewish believers. There's one body, the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, 4, which has no racial distinctions, uh, Galatians 3, 26 through 28, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and it has the Lord Jesus Christ as its head, Ephesians 5, 23, and each individual member of the body of Christ shares in the ministry. That's Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. So the content of this mystery I told you is threefold. Well, number three, it's that Gentile believers in Christ are fellow partakers of the four unconditional covenants of promise to Israel, and particularly the messianic promise, which is produced, uh, which is, flows from all of those covenants. So the four unconditional covenants to Israel will be fulfilled uh, during the millennial reign of Christ. And uh, it, number one, we have the Abrahamic covenant, which deals with the race of Israel. And that's uh, documentation for that is Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Genesis 13, 16, and Genesis 22, 15 through 18. Uh, that series is on our uh, uh, Wenstrom.org site, and also you see it in our Logos Sermons website. You can you can uh, take a look at it there, study it there. The Palestinian Covenant is really the land grant. It's part. It's an offshoot of the Abrahamic Covenant. It's found in the Abrahamic Covenant, but I broke it out like a lot of guys do. And you, can, you don't even have to say Palestinian Covenant. You can just say land promise if you want. I, I kind of like that now better. Uh, that's found in Genesis 13, 15, and Numbers 34, 1 through 12. And then we have the Davidic covenant, which deals with the aristocracy of Israel. We see that uh, particular covenant established by God with King David in 2 Samuel 7, uh, verses 8 through 17. And then we have the new covenant, which deals with the future restoration of the nation of Israel during the millennium. We see that in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. So, this mystery about Jewish and Je Gentile, church-age believers, is not only alluded to in Ephesians 1, 3-14, as they pointed out, and Ephesians 3, 2-13, but it's also, as alluded to briefly a few moments ago, it's alluded to actually in Ephesians 2, 11-22, though it's not using the word mystery in it. So again, this mystery that we're talking about in Ephesians 3, 3, and we've seen it in Ephesians 1, 1, uh, 1, uh, 1, 9, excuse me, this mystery about Jewish and Gentile church age believers is not only alluded to again in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 2 through 13, but it's also alluded to in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And the reason why is because the latter, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, develops the idea of these Gentile Christians being elected by being predestinated in eternity past by the Father to adoption as his sons. 
as we saw that being taught in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. As we saw in our study, an exhaustive study of Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, these verses teach that Gentile church age believers are again united with Jewish Gentile, uh, Jewish believers, <laughs> a Jewish Gentile, sorry about that typo. <laughs> Gentile, who are they? Gentile church age believers are united with Jewish church age believers because of their faith in Jesus Christ, the justification, and their union identification with him, which was accomplished through the baptism of the Spirit. Thus, the election, if you tie it all together, the election and predestination of church age believers to adoption as sons of the Father, taught by Paul in Ephesians 1, 3-14, also involves Jewish and Gentile church age believers being united together to form the new humanity, who along with Jesus Christ will dispossess Satan and his fellow evil spirits as rulers over God's creation in order to rule over the works of God's hands during his son's millennial reign. Now, uh, some commentators argue that this comparative clause uh, and if Colossians uh, it alludes to Colossians 1, 25 through 27. Look at verse 3 again. That by revelation the divine secret was made known to me. Then he says, as I wrote before briefly. When did he write about this briefly? So some commentators says, Say it's Colossians 1, 25 through 27 he's talking about. However, this is very unlikely because Tychicus not only delivered Ephesians to the, Ephesian, uh, the Christian community in, in the Roman province of Asia, but also to the Colossians, uh, Colossians 4, 7. He also delivered what we know as Philemon to Philemon, since it can be inferred that Philemon lived in Colossae because Onesimus, Onesimus mentioned in Philemon's 10 is Philemon's slave is the same Onesimus who appears in Colossians 4, 9. So what I'm telling you is, it can't be Colossians 1, 25 through 27 that he's alluding to in the comparative clause in Ephesians 3, 3. Because these three books, Colossians, Philemon, and, 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 uh, and Ephesians, were all carried by Tychicus. Okay? So in other words, um, it doesn't make any sense that he, because they, he's our, the same person delivered these letters to the, the, each of these groups, so it couldn't possibly be Colossians 1, 25 through 27. Uh, th this is, uh, you know, it's not talking about a previous time. Colossians went out at the same time as Ephesians 5, Lehman is what I'm telling you. So he couldn't be alluding to that passage in Colossians. He's talking about something that he wrote earlier in the letter, namely Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, and, uh, and also Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. So he's talking about this mystery. So, uh, uh, look at look at Ephesians look at Ephesians chapter three verse one in my translation again. Let me tie it all in together for you. What we we just talk, uh, talked about here today, verse one says, "For this reason, I myself, Paul, the prisoner owned by and under the authority of the one and only Christ, who is Jesus, for the benefit of each and every one of you, as a corporate with Gentiles." And notice he's a prisoner. He's not. He doesn't look at himself as a prisoner of the Roman civil authorities, uh, but rather of Jesus Christ because he's in there. He was arrested because he's being persecuted by Satan through these un, the unbelievers. And uh, and uh, it's because of he's the one who's proclaiming this mystery about Jewish and Gentile church age believers and how they're going to dispossess him and his his fellow evil spirits at the second advent of Christ. So then we have the we have. So he looks like he's going to pray here, as we said. But he's not going to do that until chapter, uh, verse 14 of the ch same chapter. So now we have uh, a development. He's got, and we have a protest, uh, a protest is for first class condition at, introduced in verse 2. And uh, and we don't have the aponesis uh, of this first class condition. Uh, we don't see it until verse 13. So he what he introduces in verse 2 is developed in verses 3 through 12. That's why... He doesn't finish the first class conditional statement until verse 13. So he's going to talk about uh, the reason why he really is in prison. He says in verse 2, If and let's assume it's true for the sake of argument that each and every one of you as a corporate unit have surely heard about the stewardship which is unique to the grace which originated from the one only God which was given to me for the benefit of all of you Gentiles as a corporate unit without exception. Now, that it's, it's a, rep a response to first class condition they would agree with him on this, and uh, we. that's why I put in parentheses the phrase, of course, every one of you have, heard, in fact, heard about it. Now he's going to develop what he means by the stewardship of God's grace. He says, first of all, as we saw at the beginning of today's class, namely that 
It's the mystery, it was a mystery, that was made known for the benefit of myself as revelation as I wrote beforehand in a concise manner in this, in this same, in the first two chapters. Verse 4, concerning which, that is by each one of you making it your habit of hearing read publicly, all of you will for your own benefit become able to comprehend my insight into this incomparable mystery which is produced by your unique uh, union and identification with Christ. And then verse 5, he says, This mystery was by no means made known to members of the human race in previous dispensations or generations, Old Testament, as it has now been revealed during the church age through the personal agency of his holy apostles as well as prophets, and he did this by means of the omnipotence of the Spirit. Then the content of the mystery, which is, again, building on what he said in chapter 1 and uh, and in chapter 2, 11 through 22, namely that the Gentiles our fellow heirs and fellow members of the body of Christ, likewise fellow partakers, and that's of the Messianic promise, because of justification by faith in and union and identification with Christ Jesus by means of the proclamation of the gospel. He goes further, he says, I assume this position and responsibility of serving this gospel according to the gift originating from the one and only God's grace, which was given to me according to the activity produced by the exercise of his power. To me, the less than least of all the saints, this grace was given in order to proclaim for my benefit to the Gentiles the unfathomable wealth brought about by this justification by faith in and union identification with Christ, specifically in order to cause everyone in the Christian community to be enlightened as to what constitutes this unique dispensation, the church age, which was a mystery, which had been hidden from previous ages because of God's will, who has caused each and every animate and inanimate object to be created. Consequently, the multifaceted wisdom produced by the manifestation of the will of God was made known to the sovereign rulers and governmental authorities in the heavenlies, that Satan's kingdom, which we met first of all in this letter in chapter one in the, in the first prayer. And, he, and it's made known to them through the members of the church, you and I. <laughs> this was in conformity with the eternal predetermined plan, which he caused to be accomplished by means of our faith in and union and identification with the one and only Christ who is Jesus, who is the one and only Lord ruling over each and every one of us as a corporate unit. On the basis of our faith in and union and identification with him, each and every one of us in the Christian community, both Jew and Gentile, are experiencing boldness, namely access with confidence to the presence of the Father by means of his faithfulness. So the, there's the, he's just finished now, something he began in verse two, namely the protasis or the premise the if clause of this first class conditional statement, which is, it presents the assumption of truth for the sake of argument. It's trying to persuade them about something. Now, what is he going to persuade them about? In verses 12 through, 13, 12 through uh, uh, 2 through uh, 12, what is he going to persuade them about? Well, verse 13 tells us. He's, this is what he's trying to persuade them about. Therefore, I myself urgently request at the present time that each and every one of you as a corporate unit not be discouraged because of my adversities in prison. On behalf of all of you, without exception, which are unique in character, making possible for each and every one of you to receive honor. That's honor at the Bema seat. So his ministry, Paul's ministry, which was to communicate this mystery, which was not known to Old Testament saints, about the church being composed of Jewish and Gentile church age believers, their fellow heirs, fellow members of the body of Christ, fellow partakers of the Messianic promise, and are composed of new humanity that's going to reign over this earth with Christ during his millennial reign, that's going to dispossess Satan and the fallen angels. You know what I'm saying to you? He's God saying to us, we're the solution to the world's problems. We're the solution to the world's problems. Not there's anything in ourselves, it's what God's doing through us, the church, and what he's going to do for us in the future that is going to solve the world's problems. The world, look at, you can have whatever candidate you want. Uh, it doesn't matter, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Independent. Okay? They're not, they're not the Messiah. They're not Jesus. They're not the solution to the problem. You know, it says the crea we have environmental problems. We, we're the sickest nation in the world. We have uh, all kinds of problems socially uh, between uh, black and white, male and female. Uh, parents and their children, the home in, in America is disintegrated. And uh, we're, we're, we're in deep, we have financial, we're a debtor nation. Uh, we're, we're surrounded by enemies. We have the cartels running our southern border, you know, shoveling with their sex trade and the drugs they're shoveling into our country, poisoning our people and killing our people and our children. And we, what a mess this is. And yet, 
God's doing something about it. You don't think he is, but guess what? He's doing something about it, and you and I are a manifestation of the fact that he has been doing something about it, and he's been doing something about it for 2,000 years. With him. First of all, by sending his son into the world. Remember, the world's problems, our country's problems, at the root basis of all of them is sin, Satan, and his cosmic system. Namely, specifically, the whole place is in, enslaved to sin and Satan and his cosmic system. We're all sinners by nature and practice, and we're all enslaved to the devil and his cosmic system, deceived by him. And Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, became a human being to solve the problem. And what he did is he suffered the he lived the life of perfect obedience to the law that we couldn't keep, uh, couldn't do. And then he suffered the consequences for us not keeping the, God's law, which is suffering the wrath of God on the cross of Calvary two thousand years ago, and was abandoned by his father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not only did he suffer that, but he also suffered the torture of the crucifixion and the scourgings. And the shame of the whole thing, being naked, crucified on a cross, and dying physically of his own volition. And so then he was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures, and he was ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father 40 days after that. And on the day of Pentecost, 10 days after that, he sends the baptism of the Spirit in Jerusalem. And Acts 2 records it. And Jewish and Gentile church, Jewish believers uh, received the gift of the Spirit, which was promised in the new covenant. The gift of the Spirit and the forgiveness of sins were promised in the New Covenant. And the Jewish believers in Jesus at that time received the Holy Spirit, in particular, the baptism of the Spirit, what I, which identified them with Christ and His crucifixion, His death, His burial, and resurrection session the right hand of the Father. And He did that because we're under His headship now, not under the headship of Adam. So there we have. Then the Gentile believers, as recorded in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius, the great Roman centurion and his family, they believed in Jesus and they had the same thing happen to them. They got the Spirit too. They were, they were benefited from the baptism of the Spirit. Thus they were Jewish and Gentile church age believers on equal footing, members of the body of Christ, the future bride of Christ. And together they formed a new humanity. And ever since that time, God continues to do it. Every time a Gentile gets saved, every time a Jewish person gets saved, they're, pl they're placed in union with Christ and also united with other with the other Jewish and Gentile church age believers in the, in the church age. And then when the rapture comes, which is imminent, that's the end of the church age and the body of Christ is complete. And then we wait in heaven as God, Father, makes his, enemy, his son's enemies a footstool for his feet. And then he's going to come back on, on, the, on, the, on the, the second, uh, second advent of Christ He's going to touch the Mount of Olives and he's going to destroy, his enemies will be destroyed and he's going to stop the kingdom on the earth and he'll dispossess Satan and the fallen angels. In fact, 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says, you're going to judge angels, church age believer. Satan's terrified of you if you know who you are in Christ and, I, and, and live accordingly. And so that's the thing that's going on. That's why we're going to have trials and tribulations in this life. If you're an apostate believer, you're going to have trials and tribulations because you're getting disciplined by God to try to get you back in a fellowship. But if you're a positive believer, you're going to have problems. And if you're supporting a ministry with your prayers and service and, and, and a, a ministry that's actively communicating this stuff, the Word of God, and not playing the dog and pony show, you're going to have trouble in life. Some of you will have a lot of trouble in life because you'll follow me or support me with prayers or finances or whatever. You know, you're going to have problems. So, you know, go say, hey, I must be doing something right. You know, my life was a highway. I'd be a little nervous, you know, but no, we're, we're, you know, we're trying to get the gospel out throughout the world. We're trying to get this message that Paul gives us in Ephesians. I'm trying to get it all around the world in any way I can. And you're part of that. Those are part of this ministry. They're praying for this ministry and serving this ministry in some capacity or giving to this ministry financially, supporting it. It's all a part. You're my joint partakers in the gospel. So uh, be encouraged. And we must go through many trials and tribulations before we enter the kingdom of heaven and we're talking about the millennial reign. God, right now, if we go through stuff, uh, it's for to get accumulate rewards for us at the Bama seat that are going to go on top of the resurrection body. God will reward you for your faithful service in this life. Do not quit. Do not give up. Persevere. The devil wants you to quit and his enemies. And he wants you to, he wants you to doubt God just like he's done from the beginning like he did with Adam and Eve. And so he wants you to persevere, listen to the, what the Holy Spirit's saying, and let's live our lives in accordance with what God's going to do for us in the future, what he's doing for us now, what he's going to do for us, uh, what he's done for us in the past, all the way back to election and predestination, eternity past. Let's live our lives in a manner consistent 
with who God made us to be and what he's going to make us to be and complete us. Uh, you know, he's going to complete the work he began in us. Philippians 1, 6. So let's, let's live, keep short accounts with God when we sin, confess the sin. Uh, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. We strive for perfection. No, we, no, we can't get perfection until we're in a resurrection body or our death, whichever comes first. But you got the victory. It's yours. Christ achieved the stra strategic victory over Satan and his kingdom. You and I can experience tactical victory. We could, because we're, our victory is his victory. And with that, that way we can, you know, we would understand that people. God is for you. He's not against you. Okay, if he sent his son to the cross for us when we're his enemies, now that we're his children through faith in Christ, is he going to freely give us all things? Romans 8.32, yes, he's going to give it the whole earth to you and the world's problems we finally saw because there'll be no more war then, no more storms, the cur curse will be lifted from creation, the curse will be lifted from our bodies, the cur there'll be a thousand year reign of Christ on this earth, perfect government, and you probably, if you're an overcomer, Ephesians, uh, Revelation 2 and 3 talks about this. If you're an overcomer in this life and you don't quit in God and you finish the race that God set before you like Paul did, our, his servant, and uh, if you do that, okay, you'll be an overcomer and you'll be a, have a position of Christ in, in Christ's millennial government. Okay, now, and not everybody's going to have that, that ability. You have to earn to be a, in his government. Everybody's getting in the kingdom. There's no doubt about that. It's who's going to be in it. A, a, a overcomer that's going to reign with Christ in, in the sense that he's going to have, they're going to have positions of authority in Christ's millennial government. So that's what we're working for right now, okay? So, and we can't do that without God's power. And God's power, uh, he indwells us, all three members of the Trinity. We have the power of God, the Holy Spirit, who's inspired the, Holy, the Word of God. And, uh, and we have that, the power of the Word of God, okay? Hebrews 4.12 the Word of God is alive and powerful, so we have the power to do God's will. God gave us a supernatural way of life that demands a supernatural way of execution, and that's the Holy Spirit. He's the, power, the unseen power that gives us the ability to execute God's plan, and the Holy Spirit is working in your life when you exercise faith in what He's telling you in Scripture, and that will manifest itself, that faith, post-justification faith. It'll manifest itself and obeying the various commands and prohibitions of Scripture. And the great one is love one another in the Christian community as God, Christ has loved all of us. John 13, 34 and 15, 12. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray this lesson be a great blessing to your people and bringing great encouragement to your people and so that they can finish the race in glory and receive a full reward at the Bama Seed. And just thank you and praise you for treating us better than we deserve. And we just thank you for the gift of your son and, the, and your, your work on our behalf in eternity past, the personal work of your son of the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to regeneration, to resurrection. I just pray he does a great work, the Holy Spirit today and getting us to go forward in your plan and, uh, and, 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 and 